Why do I hate myself so much? Yeah. So I bought another slot machine. Why did I buy another slot machine? Well, one, it was 50 bucks, but two, uh, I'll come up with, with reason number two once I figure out how to get this into the house. My parents are gonna kill me. Right, so there's a reason this is 50 bucks, and as you can see already, it does not look pretty. I don't have a whole hell of a lot of history on this other than it was sitting outside for a while, and for water damage, there's actually not a whole hell of a lot here. Like, sure, that's pulled off, but other than that, like, it didn't get wet. Otherwise, all this particle board here would be a disaster. But someone has painted it this, like, metallic purple. I know it wasn't originally metallic purple because under here you can see the original fake wood. And then they ripped the laminate off in preparation to try and refinish it. So now I can't even try and strip off this paint. I have to find um, new laminate to make this happy again. Or I throw decals on it, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Uh, internally, I was hoping that this was going to be finally an electromechanical machine. I didn't see any signs that this was electronic. Actually, when I saw the photos on Craigslist, I saw, oh look, it had the little butterfly clock circuit there for the uh, real locks. And no, it turns out it is electronic and there is well, it doesn't, be to be, it doesn't seem to be like the Summit unit where it was heavily converted. This all looks to be original, and yes, it is very dark here, so your frame rate's dropping way the hell down. Um, it is filthy. It all has to be clean, but I'm not seeing any really molested cabling here. Like, I don't see anything that says it's mouse chewed, or it's been kinked, or it's been damaged, or it's been otherwise modified. This all looks to be in okay condition. Um, in fact, here, like... That locks there, and pardon me for a second. There we go. That works, and it resets. So all that's good. Um, this seems to be okay, the tape's gone dry. And yes, it does have a board in it with a battery. And thankfully, I got lucky again. Uh, this is the only board in the entire machine. It's a single board, double-sided PCB, very simple. Uh, transistor array up here, opto-isolators here, uh, RAM, ROM, probably for sound, and then ROM for the CPU. This is the Intel 8035. This is the Intel MCS48. This is the, um, it has no ROM on this version. Duh. Uh, this is also the version that has half as much RAM as the 8049, which is in my AMC Eagles uh, onboard computer. There was a video previous I did on that on depotting it, and we discovered, oh, it's just um, an MCS48 with an internal ROM. Anyways, uh, the battery damage here is substantially minimal. I mean, we have two LS14s here that look like they took a pretty bad hit, but they may clean up. But other than that, like all these Vias here, again, two layer PCB, like super, super, super easy fix on this one here. Um, there's, there's no display here besides a win number. So my guess is you don't even need a set chip to configure this if the battery goes bad. So it's exactly like the Summit there. The battery goes bad and it just basically loses its internal settings. So I change that battery out, or better yet, relocate it, uh, clean up the board and it'll come up and it'll work fine. Not that it really matters. Um, this is a Bally slot machine. It's been converted. It's had its old badge ripped off. Here's the new one here. Uh, you throw it into Google, it means absolutely nothing, so it's just basically one of the many slot machines that came out of um, Nevada, probably a surplus. Uh, this one here actually ended up getting pulled apart, so I have almost everything. I think I'm missing a couple of screws here, and I'm missing the uh, coin slot right here, but this is undeniably Bally. And if I go around to the other side, Uh, I do have the real glass and the belly glass and the pay table glass. It's actually in that box sitting over there. Um, I'm leaving that the hell alone. It's in good condition. I don't want to really touch it until I've resealed the paint. It's starting to flake a little bit. Uh, same thing as before. It uses my favorite uh, preheat fluorescent system inside of it. Um, 
the whole thing's been dismantled because, as you can see, the chrome is pitted from sitting outside. Uh, the plan was apparently was that this was all going to be sent off to be re-chrome plated and never got around to it. So I'll have to clean that up and then I'll probably send, have to send it off for chrome plating. That won't be cheap. We have our coin hopper here and with this stupid pickleball switch. Okay. Um, it seems fine. The motor is free moving. Yes, the motor is free moving. Uh, same thing as before, like all the chrome, any like any of those plated surfaces have all got rust on them. So this all has to be taken apart to a degree and cleaned and re-greased. And then of course we do have the slot reels. Um, the unfortunately the mitzvah machine did not have uh, legitimate legitimate classic slot reels on them uh, this one does so you have your fruits your bells your bars um, this is a very traditional slot machine layout uh, like I mentioned before it does have the clock circuit here and the idea is quite simply when you pull the handle this begins to spin and this just regulates the time release on the reels when they stop and there's actually a set of switches here for that and this surprisingly um, if I wind it there we go uh, this will start up and operate so at least that doesn't need to be greased up too much just a minor cleaning and ugh, parts everywhere on this side here it's stuck so again this is where it faces in here with the handle latching mechanism on the inside of the cabinet this plastic tube here contains a rubber plunger and the idea here is that it kind of acts as an air brake to um, lessen the or to pretty much dampen the slamming action of letting go of the hander handle hander hander okay handle there we go um, much like with the mitzvah machine one here you can't move this at all because the rubber has perished and it has glued itself to the inside of this tube. This has to be t carefully taken apart and then I can try and persuade this out of the tube and then I gotta clean it and then I gotta get that nasty rubber mask cleaned off of this and I can either replace it with a new cup or I just pack this full of heavy grease and that works just as well. Um, reels do spin, they're latched right now. The latching mechanism does seem to be behaving. Uh, I do have, there we go, these are starting to pop off, they're actually starting to curl a bit as well, um, so that has to be taken care of, and, well, again, just the amount of time it was left outside was enough to do a little bit of damage. Any of these exposed metal surfaces, or even some of these zinc plated surfaces have all got just surface tarnishing going on in them, and because it's electronic, and this is what threw me off because I said, oh look, it's electromechanical because of this. No, it, no. The real plates here were the first giveaway that it's not. Instead of having differently depth slots, hence the name slot machine, we have these holes here, which is the encoding for each symbol on the reel. And that's just feeding back to the computer. In a way that means that even if the computer can't be fixed, you can still operate this as a slot machine. It's just not going to make fancy sounds or anything like that, which is unfortunate. There is a lot of work left to be done here. I have a lot of other projects on my plate right now. I'd like to still remind you we are four years since I started working on that Rao cold food vending machine. So, my ultimate goal is I have to get this cleared out of here in a couple of months. Otherwise, the makerspace will uh, move it outside for me. And I will provide you an update once the things get a little bit more cleaned up. You know, another thing I've noticed while I was kind of piecing things together to make sure I had everything was um, I'm missing the coin dish bowl slash like coin tray on the bottom. Um, and that's not the fault of the person I bought this from. I'm going to say that like publicly here because it should be right here. You can see the screw holes, but I don't see a defining line where it was bolted up against this. And then when he took it off for the electroplating, um, there would be a line there. It's not there. Uh, furthermore, these two screws here were drilled out 
and these are rusty on the ends here. So this has actually been missing for a while. Anyways, that's easy enough to find. Hmm, you know, I bet you, no pun intended, what we're dealing with here is a uh, rebadged E-Series Bally machine. I mean, look, it's even got that little tiny uh, display right up there in the corner where this one has the same thing. Right, so a couple weeks later, on and off, and here we are. Doesn't look like a whole hell of a lot has changed, but there has been cleaning done. So I've gone and stripped off all the excess material from the sides and back. I've also taken off like the speaker grills and the covers and all of that. There are still bolts here for the hinges, but just pop those out so I can get all the dirty material around there. Uh, there's no signs of mold. There's no signs of mildew. It is swelled up a little bit here at the bottom, but that's just more from being rolled around on its base. The base plate itself wasn't actually rotted out, but I had to get rid of the aluminum trim piece here because it was so beat up. So the goal there for that is this is a sample of the original material. As you can see, fake wood grain is not alike. So now I've got to find someone who sells a similar replacement to this. I'm hoping to get actual laminate like this because then it can just be slathered with adhesive, slapped onto here, clamped, and it should be all good. If not, you can get vinyl wraps. It's ugly, uh, in my opinion, but that can be done. And the only other thing that was left was, besides the chrome plating, which I'm still working on, as it turns out, around here you can get chrome plating for machine tooling, but when it comes to stuff like bumpers and stuff like slot machines, it's a little bit more difficult to get a hold of. I may have to shop around once our COVID restrictions are lifted a little bit and I can travel around. But as for everything else, which was, you know, kind of dry and rusty, um, much cleaner now. Everything's been given a wipe down here with WD-40, and it just takes care of some of the more powdery surface rust, but the stuff here, sure, that's no problem. And it helps to clean up inside here a little bit. There's a bunch of rust that I'm just not going to deal with, but in this case here, for the hopper, the switch works, the motor works, coin solenoid works. Uh, mechanically, this is all good. And then as for our big gem right here, this also needed a heavy oiling and greasing, but now if I go in here and I trip off the handle bail and then pull the currently a screwdriver and you can see back there the mechanism is spinning away. This is all now working happily. It is like there's some weirdness going on here with the plastic where I guess it's delaminated, but that's fine. I just had to use some double-sided foam because it is, it's getting hard, it's kind of curling. Uh, either I can replace the strips, which I don't currently have a source for, or just put a piece of double-sided foam tape here to hold it back onto the reel. And when you have stuff like cracks here, just kind of apply a heavy tape to the back there, and that's fine. Other than that, uh, electronically speaking, and hello there, slow frame rate. Uh, electronically speaking, everything in here is good. Uh, you can see that I've removed the original 120 volt uh, power cable. And in fact, hold on, here we go. This is my replacement. Nice soldered ends here that have been cut to length so I can feed that in. And just to connect it into here. And I've verified that all of my wiring is intact. And I gave it 120 volts, no shorts to be found, nothing blew up. Even the five volt supply right here um, with a load attached to it, came up fine. It was like smack on value. And I was able to go and I just redressed all of the electrical tape that was on this wire harness and this wire harness here. This is original up here. The shinier stuff is the new stuff. And there was one change that looks like it happened. And that's, uh, you see this gray wire and this orange wire here? That routes all the way to a terminal strip behind the top glass lamp. But otherwise, it goes to these two new pins here, and I barely even noticed it was there. There is a counter hiding right there. What exactly that counter is indicating, 
I don't know. I'll find it out once I get the rest of it wired in. Speaking of that wired in, the computer is currently not in there right now. It is currently out being worked on. But that's our progress update. Oh yeah, and one of the things I find absurd about this machine is this right here. So, the cabinet that I can tell, this is all factory original. Again, I'm like 90% sure this is Bally. But it's just, they're single slabs of wood glued and nailed together. There's nothing about that. But the steel vault that holds the mechanism and the coin hopper, it has integrity until you hit here. And then for some reason, what they've done is that they have gone with this side of the machine and put it through a bandsaw. And then they inserted these uh, two inch wide, almost three inch wide, yeah, two inch wide piece of steel and just welded that in all the way around up to the top here to add two inches of width to the vault box. And it gets even better because it's also on the door and again, so this is aluminum and they've done the same thing. They've just cut the, on this side here, they've just cut the side, added in a two inch piece of aluminum and then welded this. This is aluminum welded, like here and here, they've ground it down so it'd be a bit cleaner, but it is welded and they've done it for both halves of the door. I mean, I guess this is one way to get rid of um, narrow vaults to be used in wider machines. Like, was it that was it that much cheaper to do? That's 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 adorable. And I also spent some time evaluating over the wiring harness and the other bits and pieces that were stripped off of the door. And it's kind of nice on this one here. The Bally, the official Bally with the Summit conversion, doesn't have these connectors here because you can unplug the door completely and take it off as well as opposed to the other cabinet which you can't do that for the most part with the exception of a fluorescent tube and one incandescent bayonet bulb all the bulbs seem to be here they haven't been tested but they're all here nonetheless the coin mech has been played with so the magnet's been removed the cover has been removed off there as well so that's long gone but I've mentioned before that if you live in Canada and you try and put modern quarters and stuff into some machines it will see them as counterfeit because we no longer for example a nickel is no longer a nickel it's a steel slug with a nickel plating and the same size and weight and this would catch it so someone's converted this but the good thing is is that these coin mechs here um, you can buy these from Suzo Hap, but you don't need to specifically get this style. You can convert this to tokens just by changing out this mech. And the actual frame it goes into uh, will accept a variety of different size currencies. Um, the switches on this here for the coin shoot and that, uh, this is all the exact same. This here is the diverter, which goes down into the hopper. And this has its diverter blade on it. Unfortunately, the cutout or cutoff for the coin return has been rather rudely disabled. I'm missing the reject bar, which would go over the solenoid here. And you can see we've actually cut the wire, or someone's cut the wire. And that's this one over here, most likely. Orange with a red tracer. So that could be, they just, they just wanted to always be able to accept money. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, it could just be a bad diode. It could even just be an open winding on this and they never bothered, bothered to change it. But you can just kind of see this is a Bally part. Um, hence why it's the same thing in the Summit Auto slot. So my guess is just reattach that wire, fix that because it's a, such a standard part and we should be good to go again. Other than that, just a few other odds and ends that I'm keeping in here while the rest of the panel, uh, rest of the body is stripped out. So we have our vent cover here or our speaker cover we have our boiler plate here which unfortunately got a little beat up when i was taking it off and there's some shims here for the door hinges otherwise this is the handle this is one of the few parts that isn't um badly pitted and corroded so that's just give that a buff it'll be fine but the back plate for it does need to get plated as well and interestingly this is the payout counter right here. 
It's just a couple of LEDs in there. The very old bubble display style. And if you even look at this thing, like it's nothing special at all. Uh, pins one and two are your DC in. Pin four here, you pulse that and it just kind of counts up by one. Pin three here, you pulse that and it resets it back to zero. Simple stuff. All right, so in real time, it's actually been a couple of months and the materials have finally come in to refinish the cabinet and I have discovered I have a lot of work ahead of me. Okay, yeah, it's pretty obvious here. Material like this, these covers here, just need to be popped off and taken off and so then I can sand all of this and then we can do the contact cement method to get the arborite onto here. Uh, the strips here I'm going to getting, be getting some help with, but to actually do the final edge trimming on this, I do use a uh, bearing tipped router bit which goes nice and flush up against this, so I don't have to deal with knives or anything like that. And that works fine for stuff like this, and for the majority of the cabinet, that's fine, except for here, where I, I really didn't think about that. So, that stupid, ridiculous, kind of a hack enclosure that's made of steel here has to come out otherwise the bearing and the bit itself will never properly make it around all of this easier said than done because this is the first thing that goes into the cabinet with number two thing that goes into this cabinet being the wiring harness so every single piece in here has to come out and it gets worse than that uh, by the way low frame rate alert um, anything that you see in here we got screws and all that, little fasteners holding the wiring harness in, like anything like this, the bracketing, all of this here. Yeah, all of this stuff here is actually going through the metal cabinet and screwing into the back side of the particle board. Um, only when you run into stuff like this here um, are you dealing with things which aren't being fastened through. Actually, I think this bolt here can be knocked out from the other side. Where was it I saw it here? Well, yeah, anyways, you get the point is there's not a whole hell of a lot of it. Everything has to come out. Then the box is free to be pulled out of the machine, and then we can work on the finishing. Okay, it's been about an hour and a half. Most of it is now out. I had to desolder a couple of things, but other than that, like, it doesn't take a lot of tools to get this out of here. And couple of photos and you'll know where everything goes. Uh, it's interesting how these are solid pieces here all the way up and around but for the bottom of this thing here remember how I was saying yeah these are actually set into the box so you can't just pull this straight out. Um, instead you loosen off all the nuts on the bottom of this which is terrible and it just comes right off and now you can lift the thing out of the, bo uh, the wooden box entirely. Okay, yeah, so uh, yeah, these brackets were just sitting in the groove there, but um, it's amazing just how heavy this machine is, and yet once you loosen all the fittings and surprisingly get everything out of it, with one hand, it's out, and we're ready to start applying the uh, Arborite after we do some sanding. Okay, now that I have this off, I can actually better look at, like, the weld job they've done here. And yeah, it does go all the way around. And, like, I got a couple of small tacks here, but then he's got these nice beads and they've been ground. Like, I don't understand it. Why would you do this? Like, yes, like, the purpose of doing this was to make the box wider so it fits inside the wood cabinet. But, you're a multi-million dollar... I don't think you were multi-billion dollar in like the 70s and 80s, but Bally was huge. So, like, just, like, what was the cost-saving benefit of taking all of these metal enclosures and adding this extension instead of, sure, you had a surplus of these, um, junk them, go for the write-off on them, and then just build new ones. It would, it would look so much better. But, and it would also, like, I'm sure it was going to be cheaper, but oh well, alright. I guess they decided to go with this. I mean, I'll leave it as this. It's not like it's compromising it or calling it, making it fall apart. Huh. Yeah, really, aside from the handle solenoid, a 5 volt supply and the transformer and another fluorescent um, 
ballast, which was pluggable. All this here was soldered or connected. Yeah, other than that, everything managed to make it up in the top of the cabinet through that tiny hole right there. And for the most part, like, nothing's disconnected. So I've tried to preserve everything I can. And then it'll just be kind of a case of mixing and matchy screws on my way back. Uh, and it's going to stay up here while I do all the refinishing to the cabinet. But then you ask yourself, hey, John, what are you going to do about, you know, things falling out of there? Well, that's an easy one. You just kind of take the cover piece here. And, uh, yeah. Put it like there. Put it like that. We'll take our little latches here. We can put that down. Why are you not going down? Why are you not going down? Let me back you off then. You going in now? There we go. And then this side here, which is now stuck because I didn't let the other side go down. Uh, how do I do this to myself? Come on, there we go. Spin that around. There you go. Uh, you know, just kind of slide it in there. You do a little slide there, tighten the nut there, and uh, yeah, forget about it. And fast forward again, and we're clad. Well, that was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Uh, the texture has come out fantastic. It's nice and smooth. I have not drilled any of the holes yet for fastening on stuff like the speaker grill. And sure, it's a little dirty here, but that'll just clean up fairly easy with a bit of rubbing and a little bit of cleaning. And uh, otherwise, not a lot of problems. Uh, router bit did a good job cleaning that up. Only issues we had were on these weird angles here. Um, so what we did is that this corner's a little bit rough. And that's just simply because we put the edge cut along here. And on the top piece here again, kind of weird, but that's because, yeah, don't worry. I don't think anyone's gonna see that. We'll just clean that up and no one will notice there's a giant gap sitting up at the top there. Decided not to strip the paint off of this because this is just regular particle board. It's not actually um, Arborite and we got all of our other little strips here installed um, Fairly trouble three trouble free except for this here um, My options were to do one long vertical strip But then I would have to deal with the edge right here or I do a long horizontal strip and that worked almost perfectly, except we mm, did a little bit of a nick there when we were doing the trim on this. So that will clean up with a Sharpie. And everything else is looking good here. So all the supplies are back in their boxes. I'm just going to spend a little bit of time here. I'm going to clean up the bottom board here, install the vault, and start throwing things back together. Right. I completely forgot to clean up the vault. So the vault has now been washed and scrubbed, and now it's just drying on top of the heater here for a little bit. And while it's drying, I took the opportunity, first off, I took the speaker grill, and I used our fancy Makerspace sandblaster to clean that up, and now it's got a new coat or two of glossy black paint on there. It wasn't chrome, it was odd. When I uh, was taking the purple paint off, there was no chrome underneath, just rust. So that's been cleaned up, that's painted, that looks great. Now that just needs to dry. And I took the base plate and I took whatever paint I had left over from that and just painted this again because it's, it's honestly in a lot better condition now that I've evaluated it. It's not rotten. It's not like woodworm, it's not falling apart. It's rough, but a new layer of paint here and it looks pretty much brand new. I just don't have any replacement trim to go along the edge here, but that's fine, I can make something work. The other reason I have the uh, vault being cleaned is because all of this foam here used to line the outside edge that contacted between uh, the wooden cabinet and the vault and I'm, I'm not sure what it was, but when it came off, it all came off in pieces and it doesn't stick with anything anymore. Now, I do have a newer material 
which is the same thickness, it's adhesive backed, but it's a little bit bigger. And I think this will work because you can see here where the foam used to be. And if you put the new stuff in there, it's actually the exact same width as that whole piece in general. So I will stick new foam on there, and then when the vault slides in, it'll be sitting against that. Come on, focus. Why are you not focusing? There we go. Like that. It's pretty straightforward. And if it's too big in spots or I have stuff like the hinge here, I can just trim that out. Now there are a couple of things in here I have to make an executive call on as things go back together. Um, I have a vague recollection here that you can't actually put the front door on because the chrome pieces actually hold it all together. But there's also when you put on the real or the pull mechanism, we have this plate which goes right here. Now, uh, take this back off again, take it off to chrome plating. Um, it won't be enjoyable because you basically have to dismantle it to where it is right now. So I've made an, an executive decision here. Uh, what would I want to make this look like if I decided not to chrome plate this? Will I leave it like this or sandblast it? So the sandblasted side here used to be facing inwards. It was also pretty rusty, but I've just blasted that down and sure, it's got a bit of a shiny edge here still, but it looks significantly better than that right now. So I'm just gonna put that back on like that. And well, for now at least, I don't have to worry about it being unsightly. So ignoring the grease, I now gotta wipe off of this. I made another executive decision because the chrome plating on the handle was ruined and decided, again, instead of chrome plating it, just sandblast it and stick it on. I did not, however, decide to sandblast this here. The chrome on it is rough, but it's still usable. It's still pretty clean. So that's all in there, and that's all bolted in now. And if I believe if... Oh, no, that wasn't it. There we go. And... And it won't reset right now because I don't have the reels in here. So I'll use that to release it. Nice. So it is just about 12.30. Uh, I have gotten now uh, the majority of the wiring harness back in and screwed down. Uh, the transformer's back in, everything's soldered in place. Terminals are back in, everything's soldered in place. The shelf's back in and bolted into place. The ratchet mechanism's in place. The handle's all in place. So now it's time to finally start sizing things up for the door hinges. Now, there's these shims here which you have to put in to set the clearances and adjustments. And then there was these pieces right here. Okay, so those go in here. It doesn't fit the hole. Okay, well it's the correct hole spacing. Like the top and bottom bolt hole go there. It doesn't go over the top. The hinges the hinges physically do not fit that. So they go like this. Okay, so it does go on the underside. Well okay, so it doesn't fit there. It doesn't fit up there either. So how the hell are these supposed to go in? Well, there's overspray there from the outside of the cabinet. And then I looked at this. And if you go look at, look at this from this angle here, see that black opening there? There's actually a gap between the cabinet and the vault. That gap is the same width as this metal bracket. I have put everything back into the vault and I forgot to put this in. I'm going home. Okay, it's all together for tonight. Um, that That's it. I'm done for now. Uh, I want to go home, have a stiff drink, and then cry myself to sleep so I can figure out how to undo this tomorrow morning. Well, the brackets are going in now, so I didn't have to fully gut the cabinet. Or did I? 
So, next problem, because I was afraid this was going to happen, and it did. And that is quite simply, as I start putting screws back into their holes, after two or three insertions and removals, they are starting to strip out. And that's just simply because this is particle board. The base is not particle board, that's actual, like, nice veneer wood, and actually stuff will screw to that still. But the vault will have to come completely out again. And then I'm just going to have to fill each hole in with wood glue and either uh, sawdust or even matchsticks. Let those set and then I can actually screw stuff in again. But for now, my camera battery is dying and, well, there's another day added to work on this. Okay, and everything's out of here again. And as you can see, I've just, in this case here, I've just put wood glue in each one. As you can probably see once you put the glue in either because of an air bubble or just because of the properties of the glue it will shrink but it leaves that extra crusty ring around there and that's really all you need because once you put the screws in there that'll hold tightly and in this case here that's all we need and while I was in here I forgot a piece of foam here and I forgot a piece of foam on the bottom here so I'm gonna give that another hour or two to uh, cure and I'm gonna go out secondhand shopping and I'll be back to work on this again and there we go. Those brackets are in place now. The vault is reinstalled. The wiring is in. All of the wiring is now screwed in. All the screws are tight. And I even had an opportunity here to add in some foam, which I had forgotten all the way around. I also had forgotten to put in this metal lock bar which actually goes behind the shelf bracket here. So that's now installed. This is the latch that goes on the door. And this is the door. So I mumbled to myself that I might not be able to put this back together because I don't have uh, any of the chrome ready to go onto this thing. But as it turns out, it only really goes together with two screws here, which kind of bond those together. I mean, you do need the side panels to kind of hold it more or less securely together, but once you have this screwed together and the hinges are on, uh, where are those hinges hiding? I think I've taken those hinges off. Yes. Anyways, once you have the hinges on there, once you have this kind of together, you kind of put it into the cabinet here, line it up, tighten these screws down, and the door frame should hold itself together. Yeah, well, it looks like it really is. There you got the one screw here. You got the one screw here, actually one screw right here, and I guess this is kind of cheating. It's it is there is a screw there. There's no nut on this. There's just a nut on this side right here, but this screw is just kind of pinching these two pieces together, and just those three. Once you center it on the door, like it opens, it works. It's actually resembling a door now. And then, when I put the latch bar on, which is just surface rust, um, you then have one, two, three, four, five, just five screws there. And now I can go grab the latch. And there we go. Finally, the, uh, the front of it's beginning to resemble something. It's also worth pointing out that with this latch here, I do not have the lock for it. So, no lock in there yet. And that's a concern for me because on the other slot machine, actually, this here lost its E-clip. And once this drops down and locks, if you have no way to get in here and reach that, you are effectively locked out of the cabinet. You will have to destroy the door to get into it which we can't do on this one here, so I have to be very careful not to lock myself out of this thing. By the way, it may look a little bit cleaner, cleaner in here. Uh, I decided to throw the door through a dishwasher cycle, and other than a couple of crusties that developed in a couple of places, usually that's what I find out dishwasher detergent does to it. Uh, it cleaned up, uh, degreased it actually quite well, so... As it turns out, dishwashers are great parts cleaners, but the Makerspace has asked me, um, don't use their dishwasher again for cleaning parts, so I'm going to bring in a second dishwasher so we can do parts washing in a completely secondary sacrificial one. Alright, so I don't need 
chrome on this to hold it together, which means I can probably start bringing in the wire harness for the door, which is, well, it's a mangled pile right now, but nothing's cut. Everything's still in there, so I think I should be able to just kind of um, pick it up and just kind of like persuade everything to go back into their original locations, and uh, I'm pretty sure this will actually be quite painless. And while I'm putting the door together here, I'm also going to put in the front belly light. So this here, it's just like the other slot machine where it separates and is a second piece here. Uh, used to be some foam strips on here that has basically dissolved. So I've put new foam strips across and there is a hole here, there is a hole here, there's a hole there and there. And oddly enough, there is a hole here, and there's a hole over here, but I don't believe they're actually used on this, so I'm kind of 50-50, I guess, for some reason they drilled that out and put that in there. I'm not, I'm not sure what's going on yet. This is obviously oversized, as is the door for this. One thing that's also confusing me as well, we have two fluorescent ballasts, two fluorescent starters, one lamp. So the other starter and ballast come in here, they have their wiring and that's just immediately cut. Uh, with this I received two extra sockets, so once I get this on here, I'll have to have them try and figure out where the heck the extra light's supposed to go. Because in the other machine I have a fluorescent light that lives up here, and I know that there's one in there that goes there. And then I would have two fluorescent tubes in here that lights up the top and bottom of this. And interestingly, like this is, like it's riveted in, so I don't think, uh, no, I can't. If the bracket's like that, so you can actually put a bulb in there, um, that would be too far forwards. Yeah, that'd be too far forwards. The bulb would be too small. So, and it can't be here, because there's no holes. You can't flip it around so it fits, because now the socket's backwards. Okay, I will get back to you on that. Right, I did not have fasteners for this, so I ended up having to use a nut and a bolt here and here. There's still no drill outs on the bottom here, so the bottom here is actually loose. But I figured out what this does. I dug into our chrome pile, and this rather nasty piece. I gotta be careful because it's giving off chrome slivers, which are terrible. But this comes up and secures there. You have like your bolts or fasteners sliding along there. And they go in those holes right there. So this comes in, it goes up, and when you pull that in, not only does it hold that bar there, it also holds the bottom of the belly light in place. So that's why there's only the two bolts on top. And this piece here, which is also in equally poor condition, goes here. There's actually two screws here which have been broken and someone, I guess, tried to drill them off. So that's supposed to go there. And the coin tray would go across, and I believe that's what these holes here are for. Those go straight through, they go straight through. So that all bolts onto the front. And as for the extra fluorescent wiring lighting, I figured that one out because I was looking through for this, and I remembered I had this, and I was asking myself, well, where the hell does this go? And then I noticed the holes here and the holes here. And what's actually happening is that actually lines up perfectly. And someone's ground off whatever held that in place. The larger hole there, you have a larger hole here, and you also have more grinding right here. There's actually a rivet, or two rivets that are still popping through. And if I take this, this just goes in right there. So there's actually supposed to be a fluorescent light underneath here which illuminates the coin tray with this 
kind of riveted on hacky piece, uh, which strikes me as odd, because underneath here you have this hole here for where the coins drop out from the hopper, uh, but you have this opening here and this opening here, which are for a pair of incandescent lights, which are supposed to do the exact same thing as this. So as I put the harness back onto the door, if I see those lights in there, uh, I'm going to be confused. If the lights aren't there, well then it'll make sense. They've taken those lights out just to put this in. Why you'd put a fluorescent light down there is a little bit overkill. Hmm, I wonder if you could put a black light in there and they were doing something with tokens. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll figure this out when I start putting the wiring in. That was, for the most part, pretty painless to put in there. Um, I was able to find some screws that were the same thread pitch and almost visually look the same that I was able to transfer over. So that got pretty much everything secured in there. This one was a pain in the ass because it has this extra wire clip on there. And there was a nut up here which I had to source out. So almost everything is now secured in save for the plugs. And I can, you can just kind of see here, there and up there where these are supposed to bolt in like that. And I can't actually bolt them in because the chrome side panels bolt in through that. So you're actually supposed to put this in here and then when you bolt the side panel in, then that gets secured in place. But those still have to be worked on, so they're just gonna be hanging loose right now. That's what these cables are plugging into. Notice the different lengths here? That's because this one here is higher than the other one. Uh, other problem I ran into was that some of these bulb sockets are really jacked up and they're loose. Like some, of, most of these are pretty tight, but then you have ones like this where I, I'm, I'm not even sure what's happened. Um, like it's almost like the wafer disc inside has worn out and it's allowed the bulbs to just work themselves out and everything's popped off and it's fallen apart and it's actually shorting out in there right now so I can't really power the cabinet uh, door up at all until I get some of those sorted out speaking of lights there's supposed to be a bulb in there the thing is there's no bulb in there right now because it's not even wired in so there's a modification to this cabinet as well um, I don't know if that's from the old harness that was in here, or what's going on. There's no extra wiring for this, so I don't know what's going on in there. There was a fluorescent light up there after all. This thing here is weird. So normally uh, with the Valley E-Series machines, you will have an, a little LED display that's up over here, which is your wind meter and displays fault codes and everything. But this is different. This is a considerably different device. Uh, you give it power, you give it ground, and you have two other signal lines, three and four here. Uh, wire count, every time you pulse that, I guess, or just pull it down, um, that will always increment up by one. And then the other one here, when you pulse that, um, it just resets the counter back to zero, I guess. Um, there is no, like, there's no display on this thing here. It's a really simple, it's just an electric counter. That's all it is. That's resettable. Um, the computer has no smarts otherwise, so if there's a fault with this thing here, there's no fault codes. Um, I'm, I'm so baffled. Why would you put this, like, why would you put this in here? Like, the ballet system in here is way more smarter than this. Um, this has... I mean, it's logic, but there's no external logic. If there's a problem with that CPU, I'm, I'm kind of screwed. I'm going to have to do a lot of low-level debugging to figure it out. And I'm still hoping we don't have bit-rotted EEPROMs. That could still very well be a problem, in which case I have no documentation. It's kind of game over, unless I figure out how to fix that. Lastly in here, the CoinMac bracket. I've mentioned before, I believe, at the very beginning of this video, we're missing... Um, little spring-loaded thing here and the spring which would force all coins dropped in to return back to the tray in the event there's no power or the machines in the state where it won't let accept a coin so that's been removed but the bracket itself 
I do still have the mech. This one here is apparently a 25 cent bracket. And that just snaps in like that. And this is the little lever right here, which is supposed to trigger the eject. I don't think I have it fully aligned yet, that's all. But So the plan here is that I'm going to remove the 25 cent mechanism and when I figure out exactly what size tokens I'm going to get, which are going to be quarter sized, uh, I'll head on over to probably Suzo Hap and I'll purchase a proper token mech for that diameter coin and that just snaps right into that spot there. Okay, I just, just, uh, it requires just a considerable amount of effort to make it work. Um, nothing's been greased yet, so that's probably what that was. Oh yeah, sure. I mentioned before we had the fluorescent light that was down here for some reason, and I thought that didn't make any sense since there was already lights down there unless they were removed. The lights are behind here. The wiring's all here for them. There's one there, and there's one over here. And that actually has to be installed before you can put this coin channel in here. But no, the lights are in there. There's bulbs in it. So, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there. You know, it turns out that actually the, um, the belly glass shroud is... It's an actually in excellent condition. Um, this isn't chrome plated. This is I'm pretty sure this is stainless steel. There's no rust on it. Uh, it's in really good shape. There's no... There's no, okay, there's like one dent there, but other than that, like, there's no other damage that I can find with this thing. This thing's having trouble focusing, by the way. So, uh, yeah, cool. That'll be one last thing to take care of. I am curious. I don't have fasteners for this, so I'm going to have to find something nice that screws in on either side. And then, well, once the light's put back underneath here, if I even want to put that back, uh, that's done. Like... He's a piece there. I wish the uh, the rest of it was like that. So really, this is this is all that's left, other than the electronics that are our problems. <sighs> okay, um, like this is poor. This is poor. This is this is poor. -er -er. And. This is poorer Uh The good news is about this one here is that if we clean this up, this is almost, this is hidden behind it. So you can't actually see it. So I'd almost dare say, like, we can clean that up or even rattle can that silver and you'll never know because it's hidden behind there. Ow. Like, it's flaking all over the goddamn place. This isn't, it's deteriorated so badly. This here, not much better. I think what's happened is it is a chrome piece and they've just sprayed the inside here white. So that may clean up. More than likely it's not because it's all bubbled up. That's never going to clear up. That's all bubbled up. Um, but with the side pieces and the main, the front, like there's nothing, it's nowhere near as bad as this. Like, I'm just flaking it off like there with my fingers. Um, it's a possibility, you'll never, like the speckling here um, is a failure of the chrome surface, that's corrosion of the under material. Like if you go to in here to clean up and buff that, you're never going to get rid of that and see shiny again. This has to get re-chromed. But I'm curious if I spent some time just polishing this by hand or even by wheel, um, how much cleaner can I get it to look? Can I get away with just having some patina on this? Or does it have to go get plated? Because that's not going to be cheap. It's not going to be cheap. I'm going to make a guess here. Like, to get the Arbright on here, I was expecting uh, 100 to 150 bucks. And this ended up costing me 250 bucks when I was done. $270 after I had all my supplies. That was way more expensive than I thought it was. I have no metrics for chrome plating. This is not something I want to do at home either. Um, I'm just going to assume that this starts at $400 and goes from there. Um, at which case, at which point um, it comes down to a case of is the machine worth it? So I think we should see if we can get the electronics to work first 
before we start considering chrome plating. And in the meantime, uh, maybe we'll just try buffing and cleaning it up a little bit and we'll see what happens there. Maybe we'll get lucky. Okay, I am uh, a lot more satisfied with the progress I made today. Um, the machine is now actually resembling a slot machine. Um, there's still a couple things I need to fix here. The door, well, we just went over that. Uh, there's still a couple of weird alignment issues with it, but I've got a piece of wire down here to the lever. So I can currently open and close it, and I won't lock myself out for now. But, uh, yeah, I can pull the handle. Or I can try to pull the handle. I think there's stuff jammed in the frame. Yep, there is. There we go. And it actually does slot machine-like things. Um, quite satisfied. Alright. Next thing to dig into is the electronics. And we have 120 volts coming into the cabinet now. I have ohmed out the transformer. It seems fine. I have ohmed out that one diode there. That's fine. I've ohmed out the bridge rectifier. That's fine. Um, I've gone over this little power supply here. I think it's an external 5 volt supply. Just a regulated one. 120 volt goes in, 5 volt comes out. I've added that one LED right there because I had no indication whether or not this was working. Um, the cap tested fine. Uh, it seemed to reform fine when I put onto the bench. Uh, the wiring looks good. I have removed the CPU for this, so I don't know if that's the main load for this power supply, but for the moment I'm just going to leave that out in case there is a problem. And I have, for the time being, left the door unplugged just to reduce from the sheer number of moving parts. There is still wiring that goes up above. Um, I don't think the triax for the lights are going to do anything, but the fluorescent light should turn on. Fuses are good. This fuse is good. Moment of truth. Um, it should work. I mean, it seemed to pass every other smoke test I gave it. But three, two, one. And there's our five volt that came up. And that came up. I don't see anything else on fire. So uh, I'm going to do some voltage checks. And how's that cap doing? Well, that cap does really good. I'll do some additional voltage checks just to make sure, but uh, I think we're good to go and I'll plug in the door and see what happens. I had to go do go and uh, tape these up because the bulb sockets completely fell apart. But otherwise, I'm finding no other shorts on here. I've thrown a bulb in here. It's kind of junk, but <laughs> it's a very, very used tube. Um, I have found no other problems with the wiring in here. Uh, this will always be interesting. Uh, I did find a bad starter though. This one here will start nothing, so there's a problem with this. Okay, well, it's an FS2. You can actually still get a hold of those. That's not a problem. The wiring is in. Short check has been completed. Turn it on. Hey, you saw that. It lit up and then went out again, but it went out immediately. Do it again. Okay, it doesn't like something. Uh, it's holding this time. When I turn it off, it doesn't go out immediately. I wonder if that was it cutting out because it didn't like a load issue. I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, well. No. By the way, don't do this with power supplies. No. No, it still doesn't like it. Okay, I think it's just very, very unhappy that right now it doesn't really have much of a load on it. But our lights are on. Are all of our lights are on? Hey, even the front one here is lit up. Man, look at that thing. That tube is just so old. Okay, that lit up, and we got some incandescent bulbs that have lit up, too. Uh, fantastic work. Okay, does the counter work? 
Hey, the counter says something. 27. Uh, I'm sure it just wants to be reset. But, yeah, okay. That looks good. That looks, looks good. All right. I guess it's time at this point here to do the moment of truth and uh, double check on the card and then drop it in. Another thing that came to mind that maybe this power supply is cutting out because the voltage is way too high and it's trying to save itself. Well, the LED is on right now. I got the leads plugged in. Uh, it's not doing too bad. 5.13 volts. I'll poke at it with the scope, but it's not overvolting at least. Or at least it's not super bad. Uh, there is at least one adjustment in there, so we'll probably tweak that once I get the uh, uh, computer in there and behaved. But it's... no, well, seems fine to me. This is one of the reasons why I don't have a digital oscilloscope. I have no friggin' control, uh, clue what's going on here. Like, it's currently saying I'm averaging 106 volts, peak to peak 264 volts, 60 hertz which is interesting. I'm just tapping into the five volt input right here. Where the hell is this AC coming from? Odd. But like I try to go through the top of this. Yeah, it doesn't let me. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. No, it won't let me do it. Even if I do the auto button, and some people hate auto buttons. I don't believe in auto buttons myself. Like no, like, what the hell is it trying to do here? Hmm, maybe I'm just pointing in the wrong spot. Okay, yeah, that's not affected by the 5 volt supply. That's actually 19 volts AC. Okay, I right, guess probe up directly from the uh, power supply. Okay, this is a lot better, and I figured out why it was cutting out. Um, I have the oscilloscope attached right now. I've managed to make it behave. So, yeah, we're looking at, like, 5.2 volts. That's, that's not bad. Peak to peak is like 600, 800 millivolts. That's okay, sure, that's fine. But the reason that it was kicking out the power supply, I suspected maybe we were seeing an over voltage condition. We were. I had the scope plugged in and what was happening when I turned it on is that when it would kick out, I would see these enormous voltage spikes. And like, I couldn't figure out what the hell that was. Probably there wasn't enough load, and it was just like the spikes were just kind of going back into the power supply and shutting it down. It's nice to know I have that kind of protection in this thing. And I was trying to figure out what could generate such massive transient spikes. And then it occurred to me, oh, these. So what was happening is that every time the starters were firing, it was causing the uh, magnetic field inside of the transformers to collapse, and that was actually inducting into the wiring. And it, it could also be there's a poor ground, I'll double check on that, but just that high voltage transient spike was shutting down the power supply. That uh, now that I've taken all the starters out and none of the lights are currently on, no, the power supply is totally happy. Okay, so, well, I guess there's enough Beating around the bush, I have no choice now but to put the board in. So, uh, fingers crossed. You know, I really do wonder why exactly they stripped out the Bally circuit board in here and put this thing in. It's really, 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 really simple. So, down here we have our 8035, which is a ROMless MCS48 with, I think, 2 bytes or 16 bytes of RAM. Not a whole hell of a lot of RAM in there, but there's no ROM in there to deal with. That's just these two buddies right here. Both of them have legs which don't really seem to be all that great. I've dumped them. They were not fun to dump. This one here in particular, depending on how you wiggled it in the um, 29B, it would actually produce different checksums and the data that was within was completely different. This one here read a little bit better, but it was also a tough one. Uh, the static RAM seems to be okay. And I've changed out all the sockets. Actually, everything in here I've put a socket on now. Um, I didn't have a 4N25 to replace this one, or to repair this one, so I put a 4N33 in, which should be okay. And none of this has been tested. I have gone through and cleaned the whole board up, and as you can see, 
Uh, the battery's been removed, and I've put in another battery socket. I'm just going to leave it like that. Leave it like that for now. It's interesting. It's not crooked because I didn't like solder onto the board correctly. It's crooked on the board itself. It's amazing just how well hand-drawn you think this is. And then you see stuff like that. And then you see janky stuff like this. Uh, all right, cool. I doubt we're going to get anything because this crystal here is pretty hosed. When I was working on this, the crystal broke both of its leads off. So I've just kind of mounted it upside down and run these two fine little wires back down to where it's supposed to go. Um, I don't know, no idea. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Well, nothing exploded, but let me do that again. Off, on. That is the tilt light. So, after a momentary brief, it might have actually booted, and then it lit the tilt light up. Now, I don't have the hopper or the reels installed right now, so let me throw those back in and see if it fixes that. But it didn't beep, which is interesting. All right, I got everything back into the cabinet here. Everything's plugged in. The reels are plugged in. That's plugged in. Three, two, one. Well, that was encouraging. So this is pulled in. That's interesting. Does the tilt light come on? Tilt light came on. Does it respond to coins? Doesn't seem like it did. Did it reset the counter? Hasn't reset the counter. I've actually power cycled this thing 70 times. It's actually remembering that. Interesting. Is the speaker turned all the way down? It is. Let's put it in the middle there. Try it again. No, still quiet. What does the button do? Button does nothing. Does it? No, it doesn't reset anything. Okay, so there's a little bit of a live logic here, but it's still got work to do. I still call that an achievement. The door's on. We're getting power to places. Uh, it's just not ready to go yet. All right. Okay, just doing the initial beep out here. And I can see blindly things are happening. But if I switch over to TTL and poke at the crystal, Nothing. There we go. So what's happening now is I'm actually getting an audible beep. And the tilt light is flashing. Um, everything else is still dead. Um, is the counter advancing? Now we're at 103 now. Now, is it just causing that to beep, or is it actually bouncing around in here? Let's go back to CMOS. Yeah, it's there. But I can't figure out... Like, I don't know where the reset is on this yet, or is actually the reset being just cycled? So that'd be there, crystal, crystal. According to this, it's not being cycled. Hmm. Uh... Things are happening. I stop that. So things are happening. God, I really wish I had like a schematic or... 
I'm gonna have to break this down and s figure out exactly how the board's working. There's so few ICs on it, I can pull that off, but... Okay, well it's promising enough. Whatever it's running into, it's got itself stuck into a loop. But the crystal... I... I don't trust that crystal at all. I, I want to replace it. What was it? That is... You gonna focus on me there? Here we go. Five megahertz, I guess? December 1982? I don't have a... Well, well, shoot. Okay, well that's a problem there. Alright, so I guess a five megahertz crystal is gonna be needed in order here. So I bought some screws, these buddies right here, and that is allowing me to attach the side panels onto the body, and yeah, that's right, I had to take apart the door yet again to do this. And so these, I could have gone with half inch, like these are a little short, but they seem to be holding well. Um, same goes with this side. I still got some purple I gotta take care of. I'm gonna strip that off. Uh, I did quickly take a clean, or take a, uh, a buff wheel. To some of this chrome, it looks a lot better. But the chrome is important when assembling the front panel again. I'll show you why. So here is a piece I haven't cleaned yet. And this just... Oh, by the way, the reason this area here has such beautiful and unpitted chrome... Surprise, it actually gets covered over. So I know that this is in place and aligned properly because of the top here it actually has a little flange or recess that it sits in and that sits tight along there and that then sets the gap along here for your glass. I'll probably change this foam out. I know I got some more foam. Um, I still don't have that but uh, gave me promise here. Hold on a moment. Okay, a little bit easier when you flip it over. So, this hole here lines up. This hole here lines up, and you notice I paused there. There's supposed to be a hole there, but there's none, which was my first, well, that's kind of odd. Um, this is coming back to haunt me again. And I went to go look at the bottom here, that doesn't line up, that lines up, that doesn't line up, that doesn't line up. So either there's a bracket that I'm missing under here, which, well, I don't know why it would be there, or for some reason, it's only been held in with one screw, and all these other screw holes just weren't used. That's odd. Anyways, um, with everything assembled like this, and the side panels do mandate the depth of the frame to the front, um, the screws I bought are too short. Um, I should be buying half inch, three quarter inch screws, and then that'll work a hell of a lot better. So, back to the Home Depot we go. Oh yeah, and while I was out and about, I decided to drop by my favorite second hand store again. And I picked up this under-the-counter light. And the reason I buy these lights here is either because uh, they have starters in them, which I use for various tasks, but they also come with these bulbs. And usually these bulbs don't have a whole hell of a lot of hours on them. Uh, compared to the other one we saw, this one's in excellent shape. It's a 15 watt, but there's no starter on this one here. It's electronic start. But Home Depot still sells um, ST, no, FS2, sorry. Um, starters for fluorescent lights so we'll replace the bad one and well the match pair for the 15 watt lamp that's in the machine and that's all sorted out now too and the answer to what size screw I need onto here was three quarter inch screws originally I tried one inch but I found those to actually be too long but uh, once I was able to mark out precisely where the screws had to be uh, just drilled, or in this case here, just filed vertically up and down um, the hole. And then just put the screw in with a washer, and it fits. I do still have to refoam it. Uh, judging by 
the dirt lines that are still on the glass, it uh, doesn't look too bad so far. So I'm satisfied with that. So I can re start reassembling the door a little bit, but I still got to polish this. But now I know I don't have to take the door completely apart yet again to put this on. I can't believe just how many of these screw holes, this one's new, just, just didn't line up. And the washers are here because there's multiple holes here because the casting for the exterior doesn't fit this because again, it was never designed for this in the first place. But this was a product that someone manufactured or remanufactured and then shipped out to a, a paying customer. This doesn't look like it was someone's home project. I am just amazed at just how poor quality it is. Not even all the screws were installed. Um, it'll be definitely be a lot better uh, after this. All right, and this is the first serious fit in of the door and there were problems. Um, they've been fixed now, but uh, the first issue I ran into is that once the uh, hinges were in and they were secured down, uh, it was tight up here, loose here, and then super, super tight down here. I actually ended up breaking my brand new Arborite, so I'm going to have to glue that down a little bit better now. <sighs> but I don't get it. So, like, it's bowed. It's, it's, I'm not sure what's going on there, but it's bowed which is really odd. And this side here is bowed. Um, this lines up, this lines up, but in the middle here, there's actually a lip. And I'm not sure, it feels like this piece is bowed. And yet, when I put this all together, it didn't complain too much about fitment. Of course, we did have to take care of those holes along there, but everything else seemed fine. What did cause me grief, though, were the hinges. I don't fully understand uh, how the hell these hinges are supposed to work but we got two screws here you take those out and it actually slides out we also have our bolts to go through here um, there are no other adjustments for this hinge which is kind of frustrating I actually had to go and um, the holes on here have been ground into ovals so I can just kind of nudge the door hinges outwards a little bit and as a result now when it closes It isn't super tight in here anymore. So. Okay. Well, that's good. I've taken care of the two rivets that were here, so those have been bumped out. So. This piece slips under there, and actually if this leans out more, it just kind of goes underneath and then secures in there. And then the coin tray would go there. Uh, and I haven't done anything with any of this yet, but before I do that, we're going to go into final polishing by hand. Uh, which means this has to come off again. The sides I'm okay with, I've already done an initial cleanup. They look better, I think is the best word to say. But uh, this here, I'll have to take off again and um, polish that up. And I can probably get this back together and start working on the trim for all of this. That cleaned up with some steel wool and some polishing. Sure, it's still pitted. There's nothing I can do about that, but look. You can see a reflection now in this. That's right. You know what? I'm, I'm gonna say that's good enough. Like, from this point onwards here, you're gonna have to replate it. I'm not gonna do that. So, uh, yeah, we're good. And while I was working on that, what happened is the coin had arrived. I didn't get this originally, and here's another one. This one here is four quarters, and that fits right in here, or it's supposed to. You see, um, I've already done a bit of tweaking here. Like, this is just drop in and fit, but I found that it was sitting like this. It was sitting in a weird angle where it wasn't properly sitting down all the way. I flip this over here, um, you've no you'll probably notice here there's actually been a significant amount of filing and grinding that's happened here because what was happening was that this was sitting like it was sitting at an angle, and also this top section right here was actually reaching out too far and it was actually hitting the glass. 
So as much as I didn't really want to mutilate the coin head, everything about this door has just been nothing but alignment problems. It's so, so weird. Even though like these are the right parts. I don't get it. Um, so what I've done is I had to grind this down. So instead of being at an angle, they're now straight. And I had to go with this here, and I've, because it's at the very back of the coin head where you'll never see it, I filed that down so that when you put the glass on top of this, it is flush all the way across here now. So let me just quickly go and screw that in. There. So the two screws are in there. This sits in here, so this is nice and flat across here. And when you flip it over, it does sit quite nicely now against the door frame and the trim and this curve here. The button works and the button now fits properly. When you put it down here, I've greased this so it pushes this down, pushes this down, and the whole thing operates. You drop a coin in here or you drop a quarter in here, it, it all works. So <clears throat> that's all done and good. I was not able to clean up or otherwise polish much better this piece of chrome here so it's got the rust. At this point here, I've decided, you know what? If the whole machine is kind of rusty and nasty like this, just leave it all together and just kind of clean it up the best you can. That includes the plate down here. So I still don't have the coin tray. You can clearly see where the coin tray is supposed to bolt through. But I've put in these four bolts here to fill these holes. Um, I was hoping to find tiny little carriage bolts that would go in there, but I can't find anyone in town that sells those. Um, even the Home Depot uh, wasn't able to help me with that one there. So I've just taken for now, a set of four bolts, uh, filed the heads down to be much flatter and just put those in there and that holds it all together. By the way, speaking of this here, I have gone now and I have wired in the fluorescent light that was in there, um, but when I began to bolt things back together, like the alignment of the stuff was crap. Like this was sticking out like this far this way and it was sticking out that way. It wasn't aligned. Um, this is definitely not a part that would have been on an actual like casino ready slot machine also it has no like cover or protection so if you take the bulb off um, you can get your fingers in there you could break the bulb you could easily electrocute yourself this is not original but the damage was already done and it helps cover over that really n nasty piece back here so I put it back on so I relined everything up and I drilled brand new holes and put three new fasteners in so that's all nice and aligned. The wiring now comes up. It's all been re-terminated. You'll notice this crimp is new. These ones are not. These yellowed ones here, if I dare touch them too much, they actually crumble and fall apart, hence why those are done. And that one there's also been done. So the fluorescent lights should be good now. Speaking of the fluorescent lights, I still have this bulb here, which we were fighting with before, because as you can see, it's just, it's just worn way the hell out. Well, I went back to my favorite village of values and got myself another aquarium lamp. And really all I need it for, because it doesn't have a starter, so it's instant on, not my favorite thing. If I can get this out of here, can I get this out of here with one hand? I can't seem to get this out of here with one hand. Hold on. Okay, there we go. So this here, I believe, is it's a full spectrum. Okay. So it's not going to be a cool white bulb, I think. But what we'll do is I will take the bulb that's out from underneath here. And I will put that in here. Or I will try. There we go. And this bulb, because I may switch it out again for either a proper cool white bulb or a black light bulb, I'm just going to, did I actually get that in? No, I did not. Put that in there. If I have to change it out, forget it. If I have to change this bulb out later, it's easier to do than taking off the belly glass and then changing the bulb. Actually, now that I have all the bulbs in there and it's a good chance for me to see if I've uh, uh, gotten all the wiring for that done, so. I've gone and plugged the unit in here, and I'm just going to hit the switch, and do we have all of our lights? Oh, my hair's a coin relay. Okay, that one came up. That is about as sickly green as it looks like on the camera. 
That one came up. That one came up. That looks great. You know what? That one... That one's pretty damn close. So you know what? Yeah, we'll leave it with that. Um, where did he... Ooh, hey, the counter started. Neat. It's at two for some reason. Uh, I'm going to work on the bulbs, which you can see I've pulled all out here, because I'm making a map as well to figure out exactly what I'm going to have to replace. But, uh... Nice. Okay. Okay, so I've gone out and made a map of all the bulbs that are in here. When it comes to fluorescent, we got the two F15s, an F8, and an F14. And then we have all of our little incandescent bulbs here. We have a lot of number 55 bulbs, and we have scattered around a number, a couple of number 63 bulbs as well. Um, this is just a sample of the bulbs that are actually good and actually lit up when I tested them. So these are actually good bulbs, but as you can see with some of these, especially in the top shelf, like they're not doing all that great. What I might actually end up doing since like it needs 1055s, 563s, um, I may as well just buy brand new bulbs and keep these ones here as spares. Um, I do also need at least two more sockets because, yeah, I'm not sure how the hell these walked out of here, but they're kind of riveted in. They have like a little phenolic disc that sits underneath, and what's happened is that disc has fallen apart and they've just completely dismantled. Um, these aren't expensive either. Um, typical slot and pinball machine parts. So I'll get more of those, I'll get more of those. Um, but for now, I can actually start putting the glass back into the machine. I've been cleaning this up, I've been cleaning this up here. You got a bit of a scum line, and I'm gonna figure out what to do with the screws for that there. But uh, we should be able to see this come together today. So I finished off with the painting of these metal pieces because they were just so rusty. Uh, two coats of silver, two coats of gloss, and then after retaping all of the glass and cleaning it up, um, those slipped on relatively easily. The bottom piece here did need a couple of little extra bits of tape shims to make sure that they all stay, this stays rigidly in place. These here will shift around a little bit. So I am happy with that. And it is in excellent condition with a little bit of yellowing from the fluorescent light, but there's no cracks and there's no real scratches in here. I still have this flaw that's part of the uh, the paint slash masking that's in here, but that's all right. Um, same goes. I gotta fix this, but I don't have anything to fix it right now. Um, I might like because this is so easy to take out. I might just go and fix that later because that's a, that's either a hand drawn problem we'll have to deal with, or it could be a piece of vinyl. A black vinyl on a very thin strip, but I'll deal with that later. Um, again, it's been taped up. I could probably clean it a bit more. There's a bit of scuzz around here. And for the bottom piece here, I'm not sure. I still have that really nasty something happened right here. It got scratched, it got stained, it got resealed. But other than that, it doesn't seem too bad. Okay, it's got that there. It's taped up, that's cleaned up. So that's all ready to go back on. I uh, realized when I began to put the belly glass uh, in that once the shroud goes on and the glass is in, I was using a nut and a bolt for this hole here and this hole over here. And um, that doesn't work because I have no way to hold the fastener in place while I'm working on it. And you do need this loose when you're putting it in. Otherwise you can't slide the glass and everything into place. By the way, this all has to be off when you're doing that as well. Um, so what I ended up doing was I just dug around and just got myself some fairly coarse thread screws. And because I can access that through, where the heck was that? Right there. Um, just put the screws in there. And um, no, you don't have to worry about a nut on the other side spinning around. Okay, the belly glass is in. I had to use Robertson screws for the sides here. That seems all right. A couple of weird spots. Looks like it's been bent here and here before. Someone's been trying to get into this. But uh, let's turn it on and see what the lights do. 
Ooh. Okay. So yeah, this is kind of obvious, kind of ugly. But uh, the other thing I've also begun to realize through all of this is that why does this have a one dollar belly glass when the machine's rated uh, to set up for twenty five cents? So mix and match of parts. Okay, so that's good. So now we go on to the real glass. So I'm sitting here trying to figure out exactly what to do about those stupid pay lines. And someone asks me about that, and I'm like, well, I'm, I can't do it by hand. I just, I'd have to stencil it out, and I don't have any vinyl cutter experience, so I can't do that either. At which point they said, you don't need vinyl cutter experience to do this. You just need a ruler and a knife. And so, as you can see, I've just put a little strip of vinyl here, and it looks way better. So, sure, the rest of the paint still looks like garbage, but that takes care of the pay line. So, let's throw that in. All right, glass is fitted in. Let's do the lights on the middle. That looks okay. Actually, it's interesting. So, for some reason, the reels are out of alignment by about a quarter of an inch that way, but I believe, yeah, you can't change that because it locks into this right here. Over here, no, it's not really adjustable either, so that's interesting. So, for some reason, this is all... Um, this is all shifted over, but we know it's not the door that shifted because remember we realigned all that so that's actually All nice and tight. I can't close it right now. So right now I have to go and I've made damn well sure There's no way this latch is going to engage because without a lock in there if this closes and this latches There's no way to open the machine now without either trying to fish it through there or by breaking something here this is up to four now. Okay, so I am mostly satisfied with that. I still have to do all the bulbs in here, so that's why none of that's lit up. Um, this needs to be greased. And that seems to be totally happy now. Okay, so let's do the top glass now. And immediately I'm noticing another weird alignment issue. Like this all lights up, this looks good. But I got a little bit of illumination right here as if the glass if I just bump this up a bit as if the glass is just a little bit too low it should be more like that which is a fair size gap but the problem is, is I can't just bump it up by just kind of bumping this up here because when the door closes it holds this in place so you can't slide this off and that's already really tight so we can assume this bar is sitting correctly I also can't raise it up anymore because the glass is firmly seated in there and I don't think I can raise it up anymore as it is otherwise it'll just settle back down again and let me do this without handling the glass with one hand we can see here actually no, we can't see here there let me turn that down there we go we can see here that there isn't a piece of missing wood here either, so this here, so we can't move the glass, but we can move this. If we were to shift this up a quarter of an inch, which is basically the play I'm feeling right here, we should be able to line things up and not have any problems. Um, adjustments, this screw here just locks it onto the post. Um, there's a pair of bolts here, these are not adjustable, so... I think what I'm going to do is I'll take these off, I'll, I'll mark how far I'm off, measure it here, raise it, uh, move this, then drill new holes and put screws in, maybe the same bolts, we'll see how close we are, and try again. All I did was just spray a bit of Windex on here, because I thought that was just yellowed. No, no, I think that's nicotine. <laughs> Oh, that's probably one of the grossest things I've seen in this machine so far. Uh, yeah, that's pretty damn tight. You know what I'm going to do here? I'm just going to drill holes, and if I have to make a reinforcing bracket for it, sure. But, uh, yeah, no screws there. Okay, first adjustment, rehang, and... 
Oh, I do this every single goddamn time. Okay, one moment, please. Okay, so what I've done here is after that initial mistake where I didn't translate and went down instead of up, we're now up. We've also raised that up, and I've had to go and adjust these here because otherwise it just wasn't clearing on the top. So these are all nice and good now. So we're plugged in. I will go grab the glass. And I will put it on the track, slide it up, onto the lip, and down. And if I've done this correctly, I shouldn't see any bleed over from the fluorescent light this time. Excellent. That's what I wanted to see. So, let's close the door. And, nice. Okay, so the fluorescent lights are done. Uh, the exterior junk is done, with the exception of the coin tray. I'm not sure what to do with that right now. Uh, now we can move on to the light bulb issue, and then we'll tackle the last issue we have in here, which is going to be the slot CPU. I don't know if it's supposed to do this, but I noticed that when the coin in switch is flicked, the counter increases. But at the same time, if I reach in here and pull the trigger to release the reels, sure, I'll close the door, I'll pull the handle, watch the counter. It reset. That's interesting. What's more interesting is the fact that, first off, this solenoid is pulling in, so all coins are being redirected to the hopper. I wonder if the switch on there does that. Yes. If I flip, play with the pickleball in the, in the hopper level switch, that turns that on and off, so that's not related to the computer. But I'm not sure what's going on with the handle pull there, because you can't see it. Oh, you barely can. The CPU is not in the machine right now. So there's something in the real mechanism, I think, which is allowing it to reset the counter for coin drops. I don't know. All right, we'll figure that one out later. Okay, I had a random idea here, because I remember the coin net mech is kind of trash, and I remembered, I got this buddy hanging in here. That'll come in handy. <laughs> this is a joke phone that I paid way too much money for, if that wants to focus. There you go. Um, really, what I bought this for was the enclosure, the coin drop-in, and this here is a standard payphone handset. Because unfortunately, if I don't lock it, there we go open it up you realize what's supposed to happen here is it's supposed to play a cassette every single time you drop a coin in that plays a lame joke and then stops uh, not only has someone stolen the tape out of it someone stole the entire cassette deck itself so it's it's kind of ruined but what I need out of it besides this neat counter here is the coin mech here I'll explain in a moment once I get this out of here come on Okay, let's go back to the space. Okay, so there is the Funny Phone's 25 cent coin mech, and here is the coin mech that was in the slot machine. I mentioned before, this one here has been messed with and modified a bit. We can clearly see the first thing that's missing is that the magnet's been removed. And the reason the magnet has been removed, I have a sample here of coins, and if I were, whoops, if I were to take an American coin, this is 1964, it sounds like that, and drop it in, that was accepted. If I take this one from 2014, sounds different by the way, but it's also not magnetic, it too got accepted. Now, let's take these two Canadian quarters. Starting in 2012, Canada made their loonies and toonies metallic, or magnetic actually, but they haven't done that with quarters. But if I put that into here, the first thing that's happened 
is that the quarter's gotten stuck on the sizer. And that is quite simply, if I lay this flat and pop this open, that brass arm right here. And that's just simply saying it's a different size. I don't know why most other coin changers don't do that, but let's say I bypass that. There we go. Well, where'd it go? Well, because it's magnetic, it's stuck to the magnet. And so you gotta use the reject to get it out. Here we go, and it went out the reject side. This is a token. This is, again, a sample of the tokens that I'll be buying. By the way, these both feel the same. There you go. And these sound different as well. And if I put that in there, again, it sticks because it's the wrong size. If I just kind of bypass that arm, can I do that with one hand? Not really. Oh, no, I can. There we go. Went over there. So it was a reject because that magnet actually serves a second purpose I didn't even think about. Um, even though these are not magnetic, when the magnet is passed by them, it produces an eddy current. This controls the speed at which the coin travels across it and then over here because it's actually slowing it down so it falls here. On the other side of the coin mech, we have this little teeter-totter, and it's actually coming down, and if it's running slow enough, it'll hit one side of the teeter-totter and be accepted. But if it's a Canadian quarter, for example, it gets stuck in the magnet, kind of. Let's go back over to this coin mech here. First thing I'm going to point out is that we are missing this little blade here. I think it's used for anti-stringing. I'm not entirely sure. We also have a screw here. I'll explain because it used to be over here and flipped around. Let's put a Canadian quarter into this. Remember, the magnet has been removed, but also the little sizer arm has also been removed as well. So if I put a quarter into here, if it's been adjusted close enough, it should accept it. And it didn't. Put another one in there. It didn't. Hmm, that's odd. Suddenly it's no longer accepting quarters. I'm pretty damn sure it does. Just, well, follow along with me here. Yeah. So it's not accepting any of those quarters. Stop falling over on me. You gonna stand, stay there? There. Grab a quarter, US quarter. Took that one. Took that one too. So you still get weirdness even with a modified coin receptor, coin mech. And finally, come on, stay there. If I put the tokens in, it does actually still catch them as being the wrong size, which is neat. But what I'm trying to get to here is that because there's no magnet, a Canadian quarter, and there's no sizer here, a Canadian quarter goes through, passes by the magnet, but now there's no eddy currents being generated, so the coin's not slowing down. So it actually goes beyond that point and hits the backstop. And from here, it's on the other side of this little teeter-totter, so it hits there, goes down, misses the teeter-totter, it's rejected. I could modify that by moving it over there, but it's not going to make anything any easier. The reason there was a screw there was that it would go in, pass by, hit the screw, and then bounce back. Um, believe me, well, I'll show you it working in the machine here. I know it accepts these quarters. It's just not doing it on the table right now. But I've made a change to the slot machine, or more actually a repair, and that was causing problems. If I open the machine, we go back to the coin mech bracket here, and you'll notice I have this piece of metal here. This is the coin lockout solenoid and coin lockout solenoid lever. Um, it had been removed before, it also had been dewired, I fixed the wiring. I made this actually. I could have bought this for $10 and then paid $40 shipping from the United States, which was stupid. So for two and a half hours work, I just took the one out of the uh, mitzvah slot machine, exact same thing. Um, traced it out and then just 
ground and filed it down until it was an identical piece that fits in here. Found a spring, it all works now. So that went in there now, and then all of a sudden it started rejecting quarters. And it was also jamming. And the reason for that is because that screw, when that lockout finger is sticking through here, the coin would go through, bounce, and then get stuck because the lockout was enabled. So I ended up going and I drilled another hole. I don't have a measurement. There was no numbers involved in this. Just drilled another hole close by and I grabbed one of these C washers. It's actually got an open end on one side and that just let me adjust the washer so that now what's happening is that even with the lockout enabled, like it'll go down, go through, bounce, it'll find the lockout and then fall into the reject. And when that's not locking out, it will actually accept the coins. And as for the tokens, I've made the final say. We cannot use .984s. These are physically too big, both for the coin slot and the hopper. Uh, I'd rather not use quarters. And the closest equivalent is .900. So I'm just going to see if I can get myself a thousand of those and a uh, .900 coin mech and call it good. Here, let me demonstrate this for you. So I've put the coin mech back inside. Uh, machine's not on, so it's basically emulating the fact that the insert coin light is out. Um, when I insert Canadian quarters, it will reject them into that tray. So that works now as intended. It's not jamming anymore. But let's say that the lockout is actually working. So I'm gonna take this piece of wire here, put it around this hook, and just kind of wrap it around the top of the coin mech here, like that. And that's holding that in now, or it should be. Yeah, there we go. You might have to, there. So now it should be accepting coins. Now what'll happen is that when I insert quarters, it should actually go and accept those coins into the machine directly and not jam or reject. That jammed. That did jam too. Where are those going? Because I just saw it pop out right there. No, it is still sticking on that, that's why. Hold on a moment. Right, so yeah, I just didn't have this here tight enough. That's probably the reason why they took us out in the first place, because they didn't want that working. Well, it's on there tighter now, so let me again demonstrate to you what's supposed to happen. I'll grab four quarters. The machine is now technically uh, accepting quarters and coins. That fell out through the bottom over there. That's fine. That took it. That took. See? And that just fell out through the bottom there again. Um, and that's just because I have a piece of paper here that's supposed to catch them as they go on the bottom, and it's not doing that. But now you can see how that's working. And that's how they had set this up. So it was accepting quarters, and why they took that out, and the weird nonsense I needed to do to make this work. And at the very end of the day, because we're switching over to tokens, as we saw, the tokens don't work in either of these mechs, so we're gonna switch the mech out. Like I said, that's cheap. And a little while later here, uh, the mail has all come in. So we have our number 63s, our number 55s, our replacement fuses, our five megahertz crystals. These were a lot cheaper than you expect because it's a fairly standard value. And I have gone and I have fixed these. There's actually a tiny bit of epoxy in there, but actually I clamped it so that it is, it still pivots, it's glued in, there's continuity. So I will now have to bolt these in because I drilled the rivets out. And then we should be able to start reinstalling bulbs and uh, testing again. Another thing I've noticed while I was working in here is that the little protective windows to keep pokey fingers from getting into the machine was missing. So 
like these light they're for these lights here they're just little tiny windows which provide a level of illumination and technically these aren't even needed because there is that fluorescent light in there but I've cut these little tiny pieces of plexiglass and there's a little groove in the back layer so this goes in there and sits flush along that edge and then when you screw this into place that piece of plastic doesn't move or get pushed out of there now I don't think it will melt anything because there's this little shield here so just a little tiny thing worth fixing okay so that was a crap ton of bulbs but they are now installed and I've had to deal with some more crap here you'll notice that this is now soldered and that's because this socket this socket this socket uh, and I had to redo these two sockets here so five sockets that were giving me grief I had to do the full pinball treatment for this so this is soldered here and it's also soldered against the tabs here as well so those are working and for this one here in fact I found that I couldn't get a good contact with the middle pin and this so there's actually a piece of wire that goes from the middle pin to this terminal so that's done now so all the bulbs are done uh, turned it on and like I said I was blowing fuses so two down but I still got a bunch more in here but uh, all right uh, next thing to do is to uh, put the crystal on well there it is little tiny 5 megahertz crystal goes right in there and now I get to see if these are going to play nice. Okay, one last continuity check was done on this. I thought I had a short on here. No, it just turned out to be the bulbs. Okay. Finger on the switch. One, two, three. I don't have a tilt light. but I don't have any other lights either. So, it's not asking to insert a coin. That one's not supposed to be on, because I would say coin accepted, but I don't have a tilt light either. That counter is on. The fluorescents are on, whatever. Do I have other bulbs in here? Yeah, those ones are lit. That one's lit. <sighs> okay, I'm gonna keep playing with this a little bit. Okay, I was just kind of working here, and I noticed the indicator went first then third and I I don't freaking believe it is it okay it's tilting I wonder I don't no I I don't freaking believe it did that oh I got stuck is that a reset? Okay, so it did actually... It dropped the handle! It did so! Oh my god, uh... Four, five. Okay, that was five. That was one coin. Any two. I, it worked. Oh my God. It freaking worked. <laughs> oh, what a relief. Okay, um, I wanna figure out what's going on with that tilt switch or that tilt light there. Okay, so I did a couple more games. Um, this thing's actually doing really well. Like I got three Plums, which I guess goes to 20 coins, counted 20 coins, shows winner paid when that's done. When I pull the handle, that resets. The tilt light, so this was interesting. Whenever I was testing this with the door open, the tilt light would not go out. So if I put a coin in, first off, it saw that. But when I pull the handle, it should reset the tilt. And there we go, tilt light went out. And the moment I open the door, tilt light goes back on. So it is 
aware of when the doors open. I guess it's aware when this here sticks, because if I hold it down, if I just flick it, it's fine. But if I flick it and hold it, it goes into tilt. This button down here resets it. And you can hear it reset and it went to accept coin. Um, but the handle's now pulled and it throws a tilt. So now I have to hit that again, which resets everything. Um, and when I was having payouts here, if I let the hopper run empty and I just let it like didn't flick this here, it would again tilt out, but it would show the count of how many coins it had seen. So that was basically telling the attendant how many more coins they had to pay. And uh, yeah, this thing, this thing makes beepy boopy noises. Here, let me move the camera over towards the speaker on the side. That, um, okay, that's pretty cool. So there's no sound chip on that CPU board at all. So that's the CPU just kind of bit banging uh, sound out of it. But, uh, okay. So let's step back from this again for a moment. So the lights are now good. The CPU is good. The reels are good. The display is good. The case is good. Uh, all that's left now is the coin tray, a lock, and those EEPROMs are scary. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to pull the EEPROMs out. Uh, my Willem is not wanting to dump those 2716s, no matter how try hard I try. So I'm going to send them off to someone else. And he's going to come back and give me a copy of those. So then I can put those in there and I'll have a set, uh, set for safekeeping. And, uh, okay, the light is, um, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're almost done. And there are our very valuable, irreplaceable EEPROMs. I'm going to ship them off in this little anti-static box here. Uh, I'm going to ship with them a set of sockets, so if they need something secure to put it into the, uh, the dumping unit with, they have that. I double-checked through my stash of chips. I did not have any 2716s left, but I have some 2732s, which is fine. Simply what you do is you dump the 2716. Um, physically make the binary image file larger by taking that chunk of dump and then putting it on uh, right afterwards in the memory space. And that way it completely fills a 2732. There's actually also, you, you'll never use the other half of it, it's just like wasted space on the EEPROM. But it's interesting because if you ever develop bit rot in the active part of that EEPROM again and you dump this, you actually can use the other half, assuming it hasn't failed in the same way, uh, to recover the missing bytes. But we're not going to do that. Once I have physical images here, I'm just going to keep a copy of those inside the cabinet and have a brand new set in there. But for now, I'm going to go into this carrier, which is going to go into this box, which is going to go and get shipped off to Ontario. Well, this year came to an unfortunate end. So, when I left off on this one here, we had just gotten it to run. I sent off the EEPROMs to get dumped. I have a safe keeping copy of those EEPROMs now. Uh, as you can see, the machine is basically done. We're still missing the coin tray. We're still missing the lock. Um, and we're still missing all of our tokens. So what's happened is that in the meantime, I had a car accident. Uh, I'm fine, um, but I do now owe a lot of money to replace a vehicle. And uh, this video was never sponsored, so there was no funding for this project besides out of my own pocket. And I don't have that money anymore. And I, I want to see this completed. But at the same time, I'm not looking to sell it. So what I'm going to be doing is that, unfortunately, it, uh, well, it won't be going exa back exactly where it was, but it's going to get wrapped up, protected from the weather, and it's going to be put into storage. And then maybe one day, we'll come back to this. Uh, so no happy Hollywood ending here. But I do hope for those who hung around for this very long video that uh, you were entertained about my efforts to take this machine from a pile of garbage 
to, you know what, looking not that damn bad now, even though it's got a couple of flaws, but I really hope you enjoyed it, um, like and subscribe, whatever, yada yada, but uh, until next time, whenever that may be, have a good one.